Greetings, folks, and welcome to another Bible study video mini-series put out by Enjoy the Bible Ministries. I'm Pastor Keith Blades and have the privilege of being your Bible teacher during this series of studies. As you can tell by the signboard behind me, the title for this series of studies is A Brief Introduction to the Excellency of Older English. What we're going to do in this series of studies is look at some of the often overlooked benefits that there are to the issue of older English. Older English that was not only in existence just 50 to 100 years ago in our English language, but especially the older English as we have it represented and set before us in our King James Bible. The kind of things I'm talking about when it comes to excellency of older English are things like the excellency of vocabulary that existed, like I said, not too long ago in our English language and especially back in the times of the King James translators. When I talk about excellency of vocabulary, what I primarily mean is words that, that have preciseness and, and uh, flawless accuracy in their meaning that hasn't become so blurred and obscured by thinking of words as being synonymous one to another. You know, if you pick up, you go to a, uh, a, a bookstore and you go to the dictionary and, or the reference section today, there are numerous books entitled Synonyms. And really that's a, a demonstration of the fact that our English language has weakened when it comes to the issue of the preciseness of meaning associated and contained in words. Well, not that long ago in our English language, 35, 50, 100 years ago, and especially back once again at the time of the King James translators, there weren't that many what we would consider synonyms. There was keen discrimination between words that we come along and talk about as synonymous type terms today. And that's an example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the issue of excellency of vocabulary. I'm also talking about the excellency of supposedly archaic and obsolete words. When it comes to a lot of these supposedly archaic and obsolete words, I say supposedly. And the reason why I say that, and we'll look at some examples when we do this, is that a lot of these words that are pegged as being archaic, archaic and obsolete really aren't that way at all. They're still sitting in our English dictionaries, and oftentimes when it comes to someone coming along and talking about a word being archaic and obsolete, it's simply because that individual doesn't know the meaning of that word. It's not because the word itself has dropped out of English usage. I'm also talking about things in connection with sentence structure and, and, and style of communication. That's kind of hard to describe without looking at some examples of it. And so I'm not going to at the moment try and describe exactly what's involved in that. But simply to say that's another issue in the overall subject matter that we're going to be looking at here when it comes to the excellency of older English. You know, folks, if you pick up a a grammar book that's detailed enough to describe some things with respect to the history of our English language, or if you grab an encyclopedia article about the English language, you'll probably find that the article will talk about the fact that right now, at the present day in which we live, we have passed out of what is commonly called the golden age of English, and we have actually, we actually live in a time when the English language is in a state of decline. The kind of decline that these articles and books talk about with respect to the English language is not a decline in the number of people speaking it. Rather, it's a decline in the usage of the English language among English-speaking people. The decline of usage being described as the fact that the the, the full potential that is there in the English language, in its rich vocabulary, in its capacity for sentence structure and, and style of communication and so forth, and in its, and in its numerous words, and in its, and its words that, 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 that come from Greek and, and, and Latin and, and German and Hebrew and so forth there, 
the, the decline that the people are talking about is the fact that the, the richness of the English language and all those things is weakened in people's usage. And there's a less understanding and appreciation for the richness and capacity of the English language than there was a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, three hundred years ago, and so forth. Especially during what's called the golden age of English. Let me say some things about the English language in general, just so you have some frame of reference for what I talk about with respect to older English and what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this issue of we today living in, a, in the decline state of the English language. And we today, for example, do not use our English language with the fullness of expression and the fullness of potentiality in the way in which English can, can express thoughts and can, and, can, and can organize thoughts together. We today don't utilize it with the fullness of its potential as it was utilized by English-speaking people in generations before us and especially those that were utilizing it in what's generally referred to once again as the golden age of English. Now, notice one thing here, and I don't think it's escaped your attention by any means, or escaped your notice by any means. Obviously, between the time frame given for the golden age of English is the time when our King James Bible was translated. And once again, the purpose of this series of studies is to have us look at some of the often overlooked benefits that there are to the older English, both in vocabulary, in, in supposedly archaic and obsolete words, in sentence structure and manner of style that exists for us in our King James Bible that has meaning to it and that is designed and that, and that if we recognize it and appreciate it, is it, it enhances our understanding and our comprehension of God's eternal truths. And that's the kind of thing that, that, that is experienced in the decline, I guess I knew it, in the decline phase of English, which is what we find ourselves in today. Now, in saying that to you, I want to underscore that it's not impossible for us, even in the weaker way in which we use English today, it's not impossible for us to appreciate the excellency of English back in its golden age. Rather, the exact opposite is the case. It's actually relatively easy to appreciate and to get those further benefits out of richer vocabulary, richer, more expressive sentence structure and style. All you and I need to do is to just pay attention Pay close attention to the way in which things are said and not be afraid to learn a little bit about our English language. The English language has about at least half a million words. That's quite a few. Present day, average English speaker's vocabulary is usually under 20,000. Now, once again, what I'm saying in all of this is even though we're here during the decline phase, it's not impossible for us to appreciate the fullness of expression and richness of words and meaning that's there in works produced during the golden age of English. And our King James Bible was translated during that time. A lot of factors came together at that time. But the English was during its golden age. And the fullness of its capacity to express God's word in English is there. Exhort you 
to examine these matters even further on your own, to pay close attention to the vocabulary we have in our King James Bible, and to be discriminating in your understanding with respect to words that are so often treated as synonymous terms, but are not. Appreciate the shades of meaning that are there. And especially to expand your own vocabulary to include words that you might think are, are archaic or obsolete. And that you would have a tendency to substitute in your own mind another word which in 99% of the cases you'll find out is weaker than the one God used. And hopefully it'll whet your appetite, so to speak, to appreciate some of these things all that much more. Another example of Old English vocabulary with excellence to it. We're going to look at the distinction that exists between the words always and the word all way. And here's a passage in which you need to understand that distinction plain and clear because both words are used within a two verse span and a failure therefore to distinguish them and therefore a failure to confound all way with all ways to think that therefore they're talking about the exact same thing means you're really going to miss something in verse 11. You may understand verse 10, but you're going to miss something in verse 11. Now, once again, the two verses that we're after are verse 10 and verse 11 here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, but we need the context because, as you can see from the end of verse 9, that verse 11, pardon me, verse 10 does not begin a brand new sentence. Verse 9 ends in a semicolon, and therefore verse 10 is just a continuation on. And let's read from verse 7 and down through verse 12, and that's only a portion of the context here and the particular subject matter that is now being brought forth and taught by the Apostle Paul at this portion of 2 Corinthians. But it'll, be, it'll suffice us for now to be able to deal with the distinction between all ways and all way. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, Paul says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. The subject matter in 2 Corinthians is the issue of dealing with the sufferings of Christ. And Paul is dealing with the overall subject matter of the satanic policy of evil against us today in this dispensation of grace as the members of the church, the body of Christ, that we are. That policy of evil has three phases to it. Now, if you're not familiar with that subject matter at all, you can obtain from us that I'm the author of entitled Satan and His Plan of Evil, which not only deals with the overall plan of evil, but especially in chapter 8 of that book, deals with Satan's policy of evil in this dispensation of grace and deals with the things that we are up against as we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, the wiles of the devil in general, the issue of the satanic policy of evil against us. Then you understand that the policy of evil that Satan has in this dispensation of grace is something the Apostle Paul deals with throughout his epistles to us, and every one of his epistles is dealing with some aspect of it. That policy of evil has structure to it. It's not a random type thing. The wiles of the devil are plural, but they occur, as Paul teaches, with orderliness to them and progression to them. 
The first thing Satan does is to work the wiles and tactics that are associated with the goal and objective he has in phase one, which is a which is primarily the issue of attacking and uh, the the message and the truth for us today as members of the church, the body of Christ, and the desire to corrupt the believer's mind so that growth and edification cannot take place, or proper growth and edification cannot take place, so the Christian doesn't grow like he ought to and have therefore the full impact that he has privileged to make to God's honor and glory as a member of the church, the body of Christ. That's primarily phase one of Satan's policy of evil, attack the message. When a Christian, though, weathers the storm of phase one and is steadfast in, in doctrinal comprehension and is not, does not become tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but is established and is steadfast and, and continues to grow and mature and doesn't get drawn away from the truth and so forth, then the policy of evil puts phase two into effect. And phase two is a tax against the individual member of the body of Christ personally. And the goal and the objective of phase two, if, he can, if Satan cannot corrupt the message in your mind, is to get you to be intimidated by opposition to the stand that you take so that you are willing to and desirous of just throwing the towel, so to speak, and so you're not a bold ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ, either with the gospel of God's grace or the mystery of the gospel. And so you don't make known the fellowship of the mystery and make an impact by, make, by telling others about it and being a bold proclaimer of the message for and about this dispensation of grace. Notice once again in verse 7, he says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that earthen vessels, easily damaged, easily broken, easily destroyed. Purpose, why? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God wants us to appreciate the excellency of the power of his word operating within, even when the earthen vessel is being smashed. And he wants not only us to understand and appreciate the excellency of his power to stabilize and sustain our inner man when the outward man is perishing, but he wants that put on display, especially to Satan and his angels. And that's something that's also taught here in 2 Corinthians and throughout Paul's epistles. It's part of the privilege of God's grace we have to educate angels today. We have the privilege of God's grace of educating them in the excellency of God's power operating in the inner man. With a fullness of capacity not like anything that has been put on display before. It's all part of the privilege of God dealing with us as sons in this dispensation of grace and the privilege of the mystery of godliness and, and, and so forth. The English word always still primarily carries the same meanings to it today in the declining state of our English language as it did back in the golden age of English. It still has the potential of, the, of conveying either at all times, at or on every occasion, or the concept of continually. But all way is actually a shortened form of the expression all the way. And that does not necessarily mean by any means at all times, at or on every occasion, or continually. Rather, all way is describing the fact that there is a prescribed course so to speak, or at least something that has identifiable parameters to it, that has a, a beginning, a commencement to it, and an objective at the end, or a termination to it. And all way, in the, as the contracted form of the expression, all the way, is describing the issue of the progress along that prescribed course, or within those parameters from a beginning to an end, and describing the, the uh, effect of something throughout that parameter. All we're after, once again, is a, at least a, a frame of reference for the doctrine, and an, an ability, therefore, by that uh, frame of reference, as sketchy as it may be, an ability to be able to perceive the distinction between the words all the word always in verse 10 and the word always in verse 11 
and to appreciate the excellency of the older English word all way and to appreciate the fact that our King James translators recognize something very distinct there. It's obvious that they recognize something distinct when they use the word always in verse 10 and the word always in verse 11. They recognize in verse 11 when Paul says, for we which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, they recognize in verse 11 that Paul has that issue of the, of the uh, scope and the course of the policy of evil in view. Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 4. Philippians 4 verse 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord all way. And again I say, rejoice. He does not say, rejoice in the Lord always. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. You know the doctrinal design and purpose of Philippians. You realize you're still dealing with a satanic policy of evil in particular. And you're still dealing with phase two of that policy of evil. In fact, Philippians more or less picks up where 2 Corinthians leaves off. When you're in Philippians, it's like 2 Corinthians once again takes you through on the... On the, on the if you, if you put phase two on a scale once again of like one to ten, it's like Second Corinthians takes you through the first five degrees of persecution, tribulation, and sufferings of Christ you can experience in phase two of the policy of evil. And then Philippians comes along and takes you from six to ten. And the Philippians had been rejoicing throughout the earlier, fa uh, or earlier tactics of phase two of the policy of evil. But things were now getting pretty intense. In fact, some of them, as he says, were having the same conflict he had, and he was in prison under the sentence of death. Some had already died under phase two of the policy, according to verse three. And, and Philippians is designed to, is, is the doctrine designed to, to fully equip the member of the church, the body of Christ, for those intense tribulations leading up to the end of all the way through phase two of the policy of evil. And the effectual working of the excellency of the power of God's word resident in the doctrines of Philippians is designed to make it so you can rejoice all the way right to the end. And that's why it says in verse four, rejoice in the Lord all way. All the way. Well, there are other examples of that. Like I said, you can grab your own concordance, look that up, and appreciate the excellency of the older English word, all way. But you'd be far better off spending time learning English than you ever will be learning Greek or Hebrew. If you understand the doctrine of the preservation of God's Word, and you understand what you've got in your King James Bible, then you're far, far, far better off learning English, increasing your knowledge of your own language. There are no golden nuggets of Hebrew and Greek that you can't also find in English. And the only reason why someone might think otherwise is because they don't know English as well as they think they do. But I've made reference to, for example, the Oxford English Dictionary. And there's Noah Webster's 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language of a huge benefit. And there are books on English synonyms that were written and put together by English philologists not during this most recent decline state of our English language which we live today, but back at the time when that decline was keenly obvious because they had just come out of the golden age of English. And those, and th those are still available for you today. That's like I said back in lesson one, gaining the benefits of the excellency of older English is not impossible. The resources are still all there for you. You just have to pay attention, and you just have to want them. Prevailing thinking is the nuggets are in the Greek and the Hebrew. 
And the prevailing viewpoint is God hasn't preserved his word. And the prevailing viewpoint is you don't have a perfect English translation. But if you understand the folly of those type things, then there's nothing better you could do when it comes to languages than to increase your knowledge of the English language. There's excellency there that fire exceeds anything you could garner from the Hebrew and the Greek. And that particular word we're examining right now is the word establish, in contradistinction to establish. Then Paul talks about the desire he has for the Romans to be established, talking about once again the laying the doctrinal foundation to the edification of their souls, and that doctrine is contained in Romans. And then when you get to Romans chapter 16 and verse 25, Paul says, Now to him that is of power to establish you. He doesn't say established there. The establishment has taken place. He already refers earlier on to the doctrine which they have learned. And that doctrine is contained in Romans. Paul expects when they get to chapter 16 that they just didn't quickly read through the epistle. They just didn't peruse it. They just didn't survey it. They learned it. But he also talked about the fact that the satanic policy of evil phase one is against that doctrinal edification. And it's going to work to destabilize them. Contrary doctrines are going to come in, which are going to try and get it so they are drawn away from the truth. And they accept contrary doctrines, therefore. And that's why when you get to verse 25 of chapter 16, Paul underscores that God is not only of the power to establish them, as he said back in chapter 1, to set up the doctrinal foundation for their edification, lay that foundation down, which has taken place by the time they get to chapter 16, learning those doctrines, but he's also of power through those same doctrines to stabilize them, to establish them. That's what the verb establish once again means in distinction from establish. Establish means to render stable, make secure, to strengthen, to stabilize in the face of destabilizing forces. And when it comes to the fine line of demarcation between thoroughly and throughly, as they both express the issue of completeness, fullness, perfection or lack of deficiency or shortcoming in whatever they're talking about. The fine line of demarcation is that thoroughly views things from the outside and throughly views things from the inside. Throughly views things from the inside out, so to speak. It's kind of like back there in Exodus 21 and verse 19. There the man causes the injury and, he, and, and it, it's up to him to see to it that the man is thoroughly healed. Well, he's on the outside looking at the man, the circle, who's been, who's been injured by him. And it's up to him to see him thoroughly healed in connection with that injury. That's the outside looking in. Throughly, though, once again, he's looking at that completeness, that perfection, that fullness, that lack of deficiency and lack of shortcoming, that totality of accomplishment type issue. But it's looking at it from the inside out. And as here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17 with respect to the scripture and what it is and its capacity, it's naturally an inside work. And when it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteous to the man of God may be perfect. Perfection's in view once again. It, the completeness is there and everything. Man of God may be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. What God's word does, what all scripture, given by inspiration of God, profitable in the man as described here, is capable of doing, is making the man of God perfect, and perfect in the sense that he is truly, from the inside out, furnished unto all good works. You see, the effectual working of God's Word, that's where it starts, on, on the inside, and it works itself out in the 
all good works. Older English vocabulary we're going to look at right now and the valid discriminating difference between designating the third member of the Godhead at times the Holy Spirit and at other times the Holy Ghost. John chapter 7 verse 37 in the last day that great day of the feast Jesus stood and cried saying if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink he that believeth on me as the scripture hath said out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water but this spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified Probably one of the most common criticisms that are leveled against the King James translation and the King James translators by people who don't have as much knowledge about English as they should is the fact that there should have been a uniform translation of the Holy Spirit to Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, but the primary one is they should have translated Holy Spirit because the Greek word pneuma is used consistently throughout it and why therefore would there be such a difference? Now, like I just said, actually someone who says that betrays ignorance of English in particular, but even betrays some ignorance in connection with the Greek. Because it doesn't take much study of the Greek language to realize that tonuma is, a, is really not a very explicit word. In fact, that word has five potential meanings to it, all related in some way or another with a common line to it, resident in a spirit sense, but five potential distinct meanings, two of which are spirit and ghost. In the age of the golden age of English, is that we have five separate English words for those five potentials resident in Numa. The distinct English word immediately conveys it. Now what I'm saying to you as we prepare to deal with this is that the King James translators weren't dummies. It's evident from the number of times that they used spirit instead of ghost or the number of times they used ghost instead of spirit, that they had a real good reason for doing so. And it's real shallow thinking on someone's part not to acknowledge that, when it's obvious it's not simply a slip-up or a random mistake or something like that. No, they knew far more about the English language than the majority of English-speaking people today even the majority of English-speaking Bible teachers and Bible professors. And as I said earlier on, the greatest benefit you would ever receive when it comes to language is learn your own English language. But here in verse 39, for example, they knew what they were doing and had good reason for of the two citations with respect to the third member of the Godhead in verse 39, they rendered the first spirit and the second Holy Ghost. Now I'm giving the, the verses we're going to utilize as the foundation for our examination of the distinction between spirit and ghost. John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, and I, Christ speaking to the eleven, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may, be, may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. It refers to him as a Spirit of truth there in verse 17. Third member of the Godhead be in, in view. All three members of the Godhead are in view in those two verses. The Father... I is the Lord Jesus Christ, second member of the Godhead, and the Spirit of Truth, third member of the Godhead. That when you get down here, though, to verse, 50, uh, verse 25 and verse 26, as the Lord continues on and continues to, pro uh, to provide doctrine to the eleven here about the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost ministry, 
Verse 25, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, but the comfort of which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, bring you all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The next time he refers to him in the context of this passage, he calls him the Holy Ghost. There's a reason why he did that, why he didn't call him the Holy Spirit. There's something the King James translators knew about those two words, and that they knew about the Greek word pneuma, that governed when they would call him the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit when they would call him the Holy Ghost. And the majority of Christians on the face of the earth today don't know why. When the word Spirit is used, the emphasis is upon the fundamental function concept resident in that first definition for Numa, and the third member of the Godhead is being described as the Spirit in connection with emphasizing his function, his ministry, his operation, non-feeling necessarily function when it comes to his relationship to God's people. His ability to function in the inner man, the immaterial part of man, man's own spirit. That's what the English word spirit is conveying when it's used to refer to the third member of the Godhead. When ghost is used, you're still dealing with the issue of the immaterial and contradistinction and difference from the flesh and the material. But as that fifth definition in Numa conveys, as it developed out of the living being concept, ghost, when that is used to refer to the third member of the Godhead, it is stressing the person and personality of the third member of the Godhead. As I have said before, that really the majority of the English words that are pegged by people today as being archaic and obsolete are really archaic and obsolete to them themselves personally because they don't use them. Because they have a weak understanding of English. Because they are a victim of the present day declined state of our English language. Because they have a very weak vocabulary. There are, rather, there are works that men have done to clearly show that the majority of the words pegged as being archaic and obsolete in our King James Bible are still used today. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Third member of the Godhead is in view in both cases here. First time he's described as the Holy Ghost because he's the third member of the Godhead, the person of the Godhead who is, in de in, 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 who is personally in charge of where the gospel of God's grace through Paul's ministry goes. And he's making the decisions. It's his personhood directing it all. And they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. God said, you cannot preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mycenae, they say to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Still, why, not, why now call him the Spirit? Because there's a way in which he is communicating that. There is an operation that the Holy Ghost has that's making it so Paul knows where he can't go and where he can go. And his function, his operation, his ministry and everything is the issue. And he's making it, uh, he's making it evident to Paul's own spirit in comprehension and his relationship to Paul and he's suffering him not to do so go to Bithynia and they passing by Mycenae came to Troas and a vision appeared to Paul in the night 
there stood a man of Macedonia pray, and prayed them, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. Once it's identified who is running the show, the third member of the God of the Holy Ghost is running the show in verse 6. Now all this action regarding directing it and his function, making it so that Paul would understand and appreciate where he could go, now the, the shift is to spirit. Because that's the English word that stresses and deals with that, aspects, that aspect of things. And we really don't have the time to get into many other examples I'd like to just give you some and encourage you to study them out on your own and get an appreciation for them. One, for example, is the atonement, or literally the at-one-ment, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. And not only so, but we joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Most people today, their knowledge of the English language is so weak, and their knowledge of the Bible and what God does is equally weak. So they take that word and all they can think about is the temporary covering of sin under the law contract. And if they went to an English dictionary, they'd find out that the primary number one meaning of the word atonement is at one meant, meant being your suffix that indicates permanency. Permanently at one, no longer at odds, which is the context in Romans chapter 5. Even the context comes along and tells you that the issue isn't the temporary covering over of sin by the blood of bulls and goats. Pardon the fervency of my spirit, but sometimes the shallowness of Bible teachers' criticisms based upon their own weakness of the English language gets to be a little bit too much. You can go back and study that issue out. And also why the big definite article, THE, is sitting there in Romans chapter 5 and verse 11 as well. One of the ways in which you can tell that a language is in decline, once again decline in the sense of a loss of, its, of the preciseness of its vocabulary, a loss of the uh, richness of its syntax and style and things like that, and therefore a loss of the potential that a language has to convey thoughts, expressions, ideas, and all that kind of business. One of the ways you can tell that a language is in decline when it comes to that is when people think of words as being synonymous one to another. That's, when, that, that's an indicator of the preciseness of individual words, the distinctiveness and discrimination as being lost. To me, those are your three primary dictionaries. There's also, though, in connection with that, as I said, recommend, simply because I, I use them, it's a, it's a personal recommendation, once again, that's, you understand that's what I'm doing here, giving you a personal recommendation. When it comes to synonyms, like I said, not, not modern day, not Rosette's thrust of thesaurus and, and things like that, but Crabs, synonyms, done back in the early 1800s. Profuse citations, showing the discrimination between words often considered to be synonymous from the age of older English. King James Bible cited repeatedly. Crabs, synonyms. Unfortunately, some of the modern reprints of, of that strip out the citations, and particularly strip out the citations from the King James Bible. It's marvelous what revisers do, isn't it? And the second one I'd recommend, synonyms discriminated. 
Eli Smith. And I forget his first name at the present time also. A later work, late 1800s, early 1900s, but still with a keen appreciation for it, an outright statement that being there is no such thing as a synonym, uh, a remorse over the decline in our English language with respect to that, and an appreciation for the discrimination between those kind of words like spirit and ghost and things like that. Those are some resources you can get yourself, a, get yourself a hold of. And I'll just step out of the way here in case you were trying to write any of those things down and give you a clear board for a second while I talk off camera here to you. But like I said, those are the resources that I would recommend. Oxford English Dictionary, No Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language, Etymological Dictionary of the English Language, Skeet, and when it comes to synonyms, crabs, synonyms, and synonyms discriminated by Smith. And what I'm talking about when it comes to the issue of uh, structure and style. Actually, they're almost talking about the exact same thing. The two words can be used to uh, refer to a wide scope of concepts uh, in language, structure and style. I'm using them in a very uh, kinship type way. They almost are going to be describing pretty much the exact same type of thing, but the way in which they go about doing it is where the differentiation takes place. But anyway, when I'm talking about structure, I'm talking about the order and or the placement of words in a sentence that's designed to communicate something in addition to what the words themselves communicate. Now, today, there's, uh, there's uh, really a rigidity almost to the structure that we have for our sentences. We don't often vary from the subject, verb, predicate, structure for a sentence. We're almost kind of, like I said, rigid in that respect. But that wasn't the way things always were. And variation of sentence structure used to be the more common way of, in written language, written English, conveying the emotion, the fervency, the feelings, the intensity, the a sense of urgency and importance and so forth that the writer wanted to get across in what he was saying. More in, 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 in older English, it was more common to do it that way than it was through punctuation or especially through a variation of, of, of typeface. And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about structure. And we're going to look at some examples in our King James Bible of that excellency of older English, whereby the sentence structure itself, you get the appreciation for the fervency and the emotion of, of, of the one who is communicating it. And when I'm talking about style, like I said, I'm, I'm using the word style in a sense that is very similar to that, indicating the the, the, the personality almost, therefore, of the writer himself. And when I'm talking about style, instead of so much sentence structure, I'm talking about the way in which certain words or groups of words are used to indicate stress, emphasis, fervency, emotion, importance, urgency, and the like. They want to do is, is, is alert you to it, and just by being alerted to it, it you, you'll see how apparent it is, and you'll also find out that it's more prevalent, and naturally so, in the epistles, especially the epistles of the Apostle Paul to us today, in this dispensation of grace, than it is in a narrative type section, and that's, that's to be expected. Once again, these issues pertain to structure and style, are, are, are issues that provide for an, 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 an awareness of the, the emotion and the, the attitude, the frame of mind, the, the intensity of what was going on in Paul's mind in particular as he was communicating the doctrine and dealing with a situation like the Galatians being uh, removed 
from the gospel of God's grace. That, that's, a, that's a very emotional and a fervent situation. He's recognizing the way in which he said it to convey that through a variation of sentence structure. Anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Paul says to Timothy, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And let's take verse 15 also, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Why don't you notice the first part of verse 14 there? Notice Paul does not say, But thou continue in the things which thou hast learned, hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. It says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. The typical, once again, subject, followed by the verb, whoops, followed by the part of that, that, that typical word order. And let's just put that up there. We'll put it up there as common. The common word order. Subject, verb, predicate. Notice first part of verse 14. It's, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. It's, the, the, the subject is now coming after the verb. You got verb, subject, predicate. And that's preceded, and the whole sentence is introduced, by an adversative conjunction. But. And that in itself is not only telling you that what Paul's saying in verse 14 is adverse and has some contrariness to what he just said, but but, when it functions as an adversative conjunction, by itself conveys the fact that there is some emotion, some fervency, some intensity of feeling involved in what is being said. And not only does the adversative conjunction naturally convey that itself, but the overall context here has indicated the fact that there is great intensity in what the Apostle Paul is saying. There's great emotion in his own thinking and everything in view of what it is he is doctrinally communicating. By reversing that, by doing the verb, subject, and then the predicate, that reversal there from the common word order, that variation of structure there, it was something that was common in older English, and by it, it alerted. If the, if the awareness wasn't already there, it alerted the reader that the writer was pretty worked up. And the context tells you what the working up is all about and everything, whether it's in a good sense or a bad, or a bad sense. But that variation communicated that. And you're dealing, therefore, with a highly charged issue. And it explains one of the reasons why you commonly find this variation of structure to convey that issue of importance, seriousness, urgency, emotion, fervency, and the like. Lesson number nine, we begin the third and final section, which as you probably remember, I'm simply entitled, titling miscellaneous. And that gives me the freedom to uh, bring in some miscellaneous type matters when it comes to the issue of the excellency of older English. Let's get ourselves underway here. I had to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 8. The uh, first uh, example under the category of miscellaneous issues that I want us to look at, miscellaneous matters of excellency of older English, has to do with the use of the impersonal pronoun it and or the impersonal reflexive pronoun itself when referring to a clearly identified person. All right, we have the issue of the impersonal pronoun it and or the impersonal reflexive pronoun itself. And the classic example of that, I guess, is right here in Romans chapter 8, 
I don't know how many times I hear people criticize the King James translation and the King James translators for here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, referring to the spirit by the impersonal, personal pronoun, and in particular here, the impersonal reflexive pronoun itself. Look at the verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Like I said, this is a commonly picked on uh, issue, but unfortunately, when someone picks on it, and thinks that the translator should have rendered it, but the Spirit himself, they're really displaying their ignorance about the potentials of the English language, and they're really displaying their ignorance about the uh, appreciation, the understanding and appreciation the King James, King James translates had for the context here that made them come along, and in a, very, in a, in a, in a verse in which they knew and demonstrated the fact that they knew the Spirit was certainly a himself, went ahead, though, and said the Spirit itself. First of all, let me underscore the fact that they know perfectly well that the Spirit is a himself. It and itself often used to denote a special quality, state, rank, or dignity to the person being spoken about or to the situation being described. 20, 30, 40 year ago grammar books is that we would use the word it or the word itself in connection with a clearly identified person who would easily be identified as a him or a her, but we would use it or itself whenever we wanted to point out a special quality, state, rank or dignity to the person being spoken about or to the situation being described. Now that's what the King James translators did here in verse 26. And to make sure that you and I recognized the issue of that special quality, state, rank, or dignity, whichever one of those four it is, or combination of the four it is, to make sure that we recognized it, knowing that they're dealing with a he, as is clearly identified in verse 27, in verse 26, they said the Spirit itself. You would normally expect the Spirit himself. But when you got the Spirit itself, as older English marvelously provided for, and even our present day English does provide for, but most English-speaking people don't know their English grammar well enough to even recognize it, but it's there. Don't blame the English language. Don't blame someone who knows it better than you if you don't recognize it when they use it. But it ought to sig signal something to you. Itself is telling us that there's something very special about either the person of the Holy Spirit in the passage, or about the situation that he's being described in connection with. And in this case, the specialness is in the situation. It's not that the Holy Spirit isn't special himself. I don't mean to imply that by any means. Naturally he is, but, but, but being God himself, the specialness is automatically there. But by saying, but the Spirit itself, the specialness of either quality, state, rank, or dignity is being applied to the situation. And if you just think about the situation here, you'll realize that all the more.